Say this. You don't understand what it took to get here. You can't understand what it took to get here. It, 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 listen, how many of you know sometimes just the journey to the good place takes everything out of you? But at the same time, when you get where God wants you to get, it makes everything worth it. And so this message is for anybody who cares about the church, whether they watch us online or whether we see them in person. Today we've got some very exciting news concerning Refuge Church after much prayer and, and processing with the advisory board and leaders and all. I mean, again, we've been searching for a good while. It's just, y'all know this economy is not easy, right? And, uh, and, and it's, just, it's just not easy to try to find a place that could help us grow further. But um, just this week, when God finally at least gave the green light, we just signed a contract towards purchasing our new church home. Brother Trey's going to put that up on the screen for you. I want to share with you some of it. Some of you know this property well if you grew up around here. It's, it's, it's right there on Beeden Road, right before Beeden Baptist Church. Just 1.7 miles down Cottageville Highway. It's what used to be the old horse auction. On this property is 14 beautiful acres already landscaped. Uh, a, a pond that I'm already calling a prayer pond. And I don't want nobody to fish in it except me. I tell you, Brother Ronald found through the grapevine there might be some fish in there and that did it for me. But that's not what we made the decision for. There's 11,000 square foot metal building structure, okay, there. It's got the bones. Yet there's still very, very, very much, I want to emphasize that to you, way, whole lot more work to be done and, and, and things to, to be uh, given to make it move in ready. But that said, our first step is to purchase this property in order to do so. And this is, God put on my heart a couple months back. He said, listen, from this point forward, Craig, you can't be shy or timid and be, you got to be bold. Sometimes you just hit a season where you got to be bold. We've got four weeks to raise $80,000 for a down payment. And I hear you. Listen, I just want you to hear me. You might not think that's possible, but I'm telling you, I believe we can blast it. Okay. I'm not talking about you or me alone. But I'm, I'm asking you, and, and so are the leaders asking you to do the same thing we're doing, which is say, God, what would you have me give? Our first step is to purchase this building. We're going to do so on April 2nd. So we got four Sundays today, uh, the 10th and the 17th, March 24th, and we're even going to put it in, 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 in front of things on Easter because, listen, I don't think it's a bad thing that people understand we're making space. We're making space for others. Right now, we don't, we don't have that, and some people don't like to be in, in tight quarters. And so all we got to do is keep taking that next right step. But we are asking each of you to pray and say, what can I give sacrificially, or what can I raise, or what can I do to, to produce any, any funds? Because it's not a matter of equal giving. It's equal sacrifice, okay? And saying, God, um, but, it, but this is above and beyond your normal offering and here's why it's got to be that way because we still got to pay the bills okay we still got things that's got to be done but I want you to pray about what you can give towards that and I want you to believe with me that God is going to show up and show out you'll notice in the worship God all the ways you can give uh, whether that's cash or check uh, you can specify that is for the moving forward building fund again that's apart from normal tithe or you can give by card on our giving site if you go to our giving site you will see an option to select general giving or you can drop down on that option and it says moving forward building fund uh, you can even set up something for repetitive on, on even that you can also we've got the newest thing you can scan our QR code whether it's in your worship guide or, or up here and, um, and that will take you straight to our giving site and you can, you can pursue that. Um, but each Sunday, we'll let you know, every Sunday, starting next week, the progress, okay? I want you to join me in taking the gospel out to the 30,000 out of 39,000 in this county that don't give a hoot what anybody's doing at a church, that are not going to be reached 
people that are just like you, people that are just like me, people that are just like your family, people that are just like my family. I'm so excited about what God has planned. I, I, I have to admit, you know, I'm, I'm, I just been wore out emotionally because I know that new levels mean new devils, okay? But I want you, if you're with us, are you fit to, just, just as far as even moving forward, just say amen. Extreme servanthood is not something that you really hear from people. You know, again, it's not very flashy. It's not always um, uh, desirable in the flesh. But I want to give you a working definition of extreme servanthood before we get into the message, and that's this. Extreme servanthood is, is, is learning how to serve God and serve others to the highest degree, okay? Learning how to serve God and learn how to serve others to the highest degree. God calls us in his word as believers in Christ to, to extremely serve Jesus. He also calls us to, to serve others. Today's message is critical, not only to you living in God's will, but your, your, your um, walk with Christ having the fullest of joy. You've heard me say this before, that, that um, if God didn't have a purpose for us, then after we found Jesus Christ as our Savior, uh, he would just beam us on up. Okay, why, why, why would he leave us here? He's left us here because there are many people, most people that do not know him, and we do know him, and we need to reach them. And so that's what, uh, in fact, I, I want to say this to you about Easter. Um, I have not even titled the message, but I want you to just imagine that, that um, someone bringing a message that, that is like, okay, if I only had one conversation with you. If I was only going to get a last moment to talk with you, um, what would we talk about? And that's where I'm going to go uh, next week. And I, I hope and pray that, that not one person uh, leaves away, not, not, not changed. But servanthood is about you discovering, seeking, and living out the will of God. If you learn how to extremely serve the Lord and serve people... It will change your peace, it will change your purpose, it will change and elevate your joy, and it will get you right where God wants you to be. Sometimes you need to realize that God's got to first align your mind and your heart before you can expect your life to be aligned. Oftentimes we're doing things backwards, we're like, God, will you fix this, and will you fix that, and will you get this person right, and that person right, and all those things might be God's will. But God's will first is that he could change you and me from the inside out. So today I want us to look at some keys to extreme servanthood. The first key is this, when it comes to extreme servanthood, and that is we need an extreme example. We need an extreme example. The Bible's crystal clear. Jesus is that extreme example. And we're not supposed to follow the example of, of the world. Sometimes we're not even meant to, to, to follow the example of what we grew up with. All of us come from different places in here, different experiences. Maybe or maybe not you grew up in a Christian home. Most people didn't. Um, plenty of people have grown up with people that didn't even profess any kind of faith because it isn't just about going to church. Sometimes it's just, hey, you know, can anybody even believe that you have a faith? But we weren't called to live like everybody else. Amen? We're, we're, we're the called out ones. 
We're the church. We're the body of Christ. We're supposed to not live like or look like everybody else. And so to do that, we have to follow Jesus' perfect example instead of um, getting swallowed up by the crowd. I want you to hear me. It's a lot easier to just mesh in. It's a lot easier to just blend in. But yet God's like, well, you know what? Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and your heart, and then you will know God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you're wanting to know God's good, pleasing, and perfect will, you have to start with looking to Jesus. Jesus lived 33 years on this earth in human form so that he could demonstrate to us how we're to live in human form. For the little bit of time that God gives us. Listen, the world does extremely what it wants, when it wants, how it wants. Making up its own rules as they go. Serving their own desires. You know, I've told you before, I have a little bit of a problem when we're trying to say, you know, you, you, uh, it, anybody can be whatever they want to be. That, that's just true. But, but you don't want to be just who you can be. You want to be who he called you to be. Your, your potential through your eyes is, is, is down here. His potential is beyond what you're thinking. Some of you, you come in here today and, and, and you've, you just feel like there's a lot of things and hindrances in your life. And, and what you don't realize is if you'll just let God use all of those experiences and all of those dark moments and all of those tough times and you get on the right and the straight and narrow, you might be extremely surprised how much God uses your brokenness. Now, Jesus wanted to show his earliest disciples, just what he wants us to know, and that is how extreme our servanthood should be. So Jesus, he did everything humanly possible that a, a person could do to serve God and serve others, but he went where I probably wouldn't. I wouldn't sign up for this event, and that is Jesus went as far to say, hey, put your feet up and let me wash them. Now listen, you could have to pay me some good money to wash feet. In fact, I mean, I'm thinking about it right now. Man, I hate it when the Spirit hits me. I don't know if it's the Spirit or the flesh. It, listen, you'd be pressure washed. Okay? And you'll have three settings. Low, medium, and shoots your foot off. Okay? I love it when God gives me things that basically look like, make me look like an idiot. And I, I apologize in advance. I, I, I'm just, as my son would say, I'm just the way God made me. Bless it. I want you to hear what Jesus did here and what Jesus said. In John chapter 13, verses 12 through 17, it says, After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I'm doing? Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I've done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Listen, God will bless a servant's heart. God will bless a person who's do, doing the best of their ability to be Jesus to those around him. Listen, Jesus, his extreme servanthood, I want you to write this down. It was not an event. It was a lifestyle. It was not moments of, hey, let me just wash your feet. Those were just reflections along the way. But Jesus lived with extreme servanthood. The only reason he came was for you. The only reason he died was for you. Mark chapter 10 verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man, he came not to be served but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for Many, listen, if we don't do everything we possibly can to love, lift, and lead people to Jesus, we are wasting his sacrifice. We are, we are saying, Jesus, I know you showed extraordinary um, love and, and, and you gave your life on the cross for me and, 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 and you provide this opportunity for salvation, but um, yeah, I want it, but I'm not going to share it. By the way, how can you believe that? If you, if you believe in salvation and then you believe most people don't have salvation, that should be highly motivating to you, like highly. I, I, I was just um, speaking to a gentleman who um, is, is the pastor outside of my family that, that impacted my life the most, and he was an evangelist, and, and he always um, 
uh, I, I worked at a, a Christian summer camp three different um, summers. And, um, and he's where I found Christ, gave my life to Christ at 10. And then at 18, I, I surrendered my life to full-time Christian ministry, even though I had never pondered it before. Um, but, um, but I wanted him to know, um, he, he almost died here recently. And, and, and all of a sudden, I get a call from this guy. And this guy knows a lot of people. So I knew it was going to be very strange that he just called me first. And then I realized it was his wife. And they were at MSC Hospital, and, and something had gone wrong with just what was, should have been a normal procedure, nothing, nothing life-threatening. Um, and, and all of a sudden, it just gushed through me what that man meant to me. Okay? You ever have that happen? By the way, a lot of times we have that happen once people are gone. We need to recognize that while we live. Okay? So you know what I did? I shared with that guy, it was like two nights ago or so. The guy just hit me. I said, listen... I said, brother, um, I want to share this with you. Um, I said, uh, I said, I was telling my mom what an impact you had on my life, and and um, and 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 how it just hit me so hard, just when we were frightened that you were going to lose your life, and and I said, I decided I'm going to share it now that I get the opportunity, now that I get a second chance. I'm sending directly to you exactly what I would have said at your funeral. And, and he was deeply touched. Why? Because he's been living his life for almost 50 years, surrendered to Christ, trying to do everything he possibly could do. And he needed to remember sometimes or hear sometimes, hey, this is a life change because of my faithfulness. Okay? Best fresh water to me any day is, is seeing anybody's lives changed. That's, that's the only goal is to, see, is to see what we're doing, making a difference. And what God put on my heart was this was the guy that... that that um, uh, inspired me to write what he had in his Bible. God, never may I get used to boys, girls, men, women going to hell. I'm telling you right now, when you get used to it, this church will not be growing. And I want you to understand, I say it as frankly as I can. We, I don't want to have church. I love praise and worship, I do. I, I enjoy praise. But listen, if we aren't seeking to fulfill the mission that God has us on earth for, it's a waste of breath. Worship should change us, not just um, bring adoration to God. It should change us. When we believe what we're singing and we believe what God's called us to do, listen, Jesus came to serve God and to serve others, and he is the ultimate example for us to follow so that that is our way of life. So that we look the same on Monday morning as we seem to be on Sunday morning. The Apostle Paul, he said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he said, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I do to the best of my ability every day I wake up. I say, God, help me to stay clean and close to you because I don't want to cause anybody else to stumble. And I want to be as much of your messenger as I possibly could be. That's not always from the pulpit, you see. You, that, that, that's, listen, sometimes you got to till in, you got to work in the weeds and in the, in the ditches out there to even get any credibility in the pulpit. Okay. We have to follow the example of Christ. And then when we ask other people to come with us, we're, we're mindful that, Hey, just as Jesus is the example for all of us, we often, what do they say? We're the only Jesus. Some people see, where's it pointing them to? Do you look like Jesus? Do I look like Jesus? But secondly, when it comes to extreme servanthood, we need extreme love. We need extreme love. Everything Jesus ever did, it was fueled by his love for God and his love for people. The world's love, it is extremely, un, it is extremely unconditional. Jesus' love is extremely unconditional. He died for you and me before we ever turned to him. Even while we were still sinners, it says Christ died. Listen, Jesus says, I will love you no matter what. The world says, I will love you if, if you do this for me, if you, if you um, do things my way. Listen, it doesn't matter how much you disagree with what anybody does outside the church or inside the church. That's Satan trying to choke me up up here. <clears throat> that is going to fire me up. I'm going to say it louder, okay? It does not matter. What you agree with, what you don't like out there, or you don't like in here, God never gives you an excuse and a permission slip to be ugly in the name of Jesus. You can, be con you can speak with conviction, such as I'm speaking to you right now, but love is not an option for the true believer and follower of Jesus Christ. 
We are called to exemplify Christ's extreme love with no strings attached. Well, Jesus goes all out. The person that you call trash, he calls treasure. The person that you and I might give up on, he's still believing for. He's still got his arms open wide. He's still, he's still going, hey, maybe today they'll find me. Listen, we've got to love people with no strings attached. We don't need to change our standards. We don't need to change God's word. We need to love people despite people. John chapter 12, 9 through 14, Jesus says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. How many of you know it feels good to do the right thing? How many of you know it, does, it feels good to love somebody in a way that it changes their life? You cannot have the full joy of your salvation when all you are is sitting like little Jack Horner over in the corner just waiting on heaven. But when you surrender your life and you believe that every second, millisecond of your life that God can use your life, even if it's just love pouring through you, even if it's just prayers that you are doing on people's behalf, it makes a difference. He says, yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Now, I'm about to say something because it just jumped all up on me. I do not understand people who call themselves radical followers of Christ and yet it's obvious they don't know how to love people. I cannot relate to it. It makes me want to clean go back crazy. I mean back crazy. Okay? And the reason I say it, because when it's church folks or church leaders, Jesus ain't got no time for that. I think you can tell right now I'm having to calm myself down. That elevates my blood pressure. And guess what? It, ele it elevated Jesus' blood pressure. The only people he looked in the face and was like, listen, you snot-nosed people is people who thought they were better than everybody else. Listen, just because Jesus loves you don't mean he won't confront you. He'll come on and get up all in your business. But I'm just telling you, the worst thing we can do ever as a human being, as a Christian, and as a child of God is to not reflect the love of God. You can say whatever you need to say and do whatever you need to do, but love should still pour through your veins. And if it's not God's love, it's not God's will. You don't have to hang out with somebody and have a cup of coffee every day, but you can still love them. Listen, I, I don't know, how, how, how can we not love others when we know how much Christ has loved us despite us? Philippians 2, 1 through 2 says, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. We've got to be on the same page. We've all got to be walking in his love. We've got to be walking in his love, and we've got to make sure that we are letting his love and our lives point to the cross. Otherwise, people will get hindered by people who are acting like normal people instead of God's people. I don't know if you have some people in your life that, that you've really not um, communicated just that you love them or that you forgive them or, or whatever. Get, like I said, you don't have to like them. You don't have to like what they did. You, don't have to, you, you may have to keep a long, long distance between you and them. But I'm telling you right now, you can't get right with God on the altar without making things right with other people. So, so you only have, you have your responsibility. They have their responsibility. But your responsibility is you don't get a license to do whatever you want to do. You got you to gotta do what you know God would have you to do and then give that over to him. Christ's love for us and through us is what should, should be pouring through us. God's love should compel our love. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. It says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. If someone was to ask me that he'd just come to Christ, now what? 
I would say now you learn and you decide to, to live for the Lord the rest of your life. You, you have to, you have to um, share your story and you have to grow up in Christ. Listen, Jesus' love was not just spoken, it was demonstrated. If I got to choose between just empty words versus actions that demonstrate that, I need to just go mute. And by the way, sometimes we do have to go mute. If you like me, you got to go mute a lot. I mean, I wish I had a mute button. Man, I mean, I, I, I mean it'll save our marriage, guys. Boop. So I'm going to have to see. I'm going to have to see if I had that. In fact, I think I had, um, uh, what is it, Staples. Remember when Staples had the easy button? I, somebody gave me one one time. Man, I got to find that thing so I could just hit it. Be like, that's easy. 1 John 3.18 says, little children, let us stop just saying we love people. Let us really love them and show it by our actions. Like you've heard me say before, a 94-year-old lady that was in the St. George nursing home, we had never met before. I was, I was there on that particular day ministering to them, and, and this was several years ago. And, and I said, I love you, ma'am. And she looked me straight in the eyes. She said, love such a strong word. I was like, well, I like you. <laughs> I mean, what else was I supposed to say? She looked like she was about to take me down. <laughs> she was going to wheel forward and drive clean over me. But, but you know what? That let me know. She's seen people with empty words. She's, seen, she's been somewhere, you see? She's heard people say, I love you, but they don't show they love you. Listen, actions speak louder than words. Amen? That's what we have to be about. Listen, it, it, it can't be a, 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 a cute saying to love, lift, lead. It's got to be written in our hearts and, and, and the goal of our lives that no matter where we are, his love abounds. But thirdly, when it comes to extreme servanthood, we need extreme unselfishness. Extreme unselfishness. Um, here's what extreme unselfishness is. It's setting aside your interests for the sake of meeting the needs of others. Is setting aside your interests for the sake of meeting the needs of others. Listen, you're either, in all times in your life, you're either seeking to be served or you're seeking to serve. You're either wanting what you want or seeing how God might use you to help others. And Now, you need to understand this. You can have needs, and we all do, and you're, you can process those needs, and you can even ask for help from people. You need to do that when you, when, when, when you need to. Um, but you can, you can need things and still be serving others. Any of you ever been you, in a bad season in your life? Yeah, you still, while you're, um, I, I've, I think about this. I mean, I've, I've, I've probably gotten 30-something steroid injections because of my, my back issues. And, and um, normally the first thing I do as soon as I get into that um, waiting room is I look to see who God can use me. Um, to encourage that, that, that might not have the hope I have, that might not have the peace I have. I just start with whoever looks like they're the most down and, and just barely got up. I'm like, okay, God, that's my assignment. Because, listen, everywhere you go, God's got an assignment. We miss those assignments often because we, we take ourselves off duty. Do you hear me? You're never to be off duty. You're always his ambassador. You're always his mouthpiece. You're always his example in the flesh. Be very careful who you tell that you're a Christian if you're not trying to love them and lead them unselfishly. They, they need to see the heartbeat of Jesus when they see your heartbeat. Listen, even when we take in God's word or we pursue God's word, we're either looking for what we want or what God wants. Every time you hear a message... You're either going, oh, yeah, I like that, or I don't want to do that. Listen, we, we're either looking for how things can serve us or how things can serve God. We, we live in a selfish, self-focused world. So following Christ, listen, it's an exact opposite. It is a 180. In fact, if you go by majority of people, you're on the wrong track. If you're going by popular opinion, if you're just going by impulsive um, thoughts and behavior, listen, all of us can go cray-cray, okay? You ain't the only ones. I mean, I say it on behalf of every Crosby I know. We are crazy. I'm a lot less crazy than them. Y'all know what I, y'all know that. Y'all ought to meet some of my family. You'd be like, well, he looks normal. Listen, 
we need to make sure that we don't act in the flesh, but that we're led by the Spirit. That Spirit needs a spirit of love, and that Spirit needs to be a spirit of unselfishness. Philippians 2, 3 and 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. One of the things we realize at this church is people are tired of empty words. God has told me to be bold. I cannot help if it offends anybody. We are not in competition with any church. And the reason I tell you we're not in competition with any church because we are not trying to play musical church. We're trying to reach the 75% of society that aren't going to go to a church. That very few people are truly saying, hey, we want them with the mess, with the madness. In fact, I want you to visualize with me the person that you think is a hopeless cause, the person that you think would never walk into a church, the person who you know is desperate for God's grace and his love, bring them here. We will love them as best we possibly can. No strings attached. Listen, people are tired of people saying they care, then demonstrating that they only care about their own agenda. Therefore, we need to operate with genuine unselfishness towards others. We tell you around here, listen, it, it hurt my heart even when we were, I was having to give you the bold goal that God put on my heart about raising $80,000 in four weeks. And then I realized the mission that we're headed towards, it is not self-centered. It is God-led, okay? It is not about what we want from people. It's about what we want for people. And we're able to look at you in the eyes and go, listen, we don't have a selfish agenda here. But we hadn't even begun to reach all that we're going to reach. Listen, I'm going to just tell you, I mean, it just jumps at me sometime. There's not going to be a place 40 miles of us in any direction to see what we're going to see. Period. You can ask my mom. I told her that years ago. Sometimes, though, again, it just takes a while to get where God's got you to be because he's got he's to get you there. You see what I'm saying? Some, some of us, we, we just got to be in God's workshop a little longer sometimes than we think. But man, when he all of a sudden brings it, you're like, okay, God, you do know best. You do have this working it out. Listen, we need to operate always with an unselfishness. We need to give up our chair when we can give up our chair. We need to put out a helping hand when we can put out a helping hand. We need to always be seeking to try to care about those around us. In fact, especially our family and our friends, but also total strangers. Listen, I've seen many a person walk through the doors of a church all because someone showed them extreme kindness. And they believed that maybe they cared. Romans 12, 10 through 13 says, Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. We've got a miss hospitality and we got a hospitality area, but I need you to understand everyone in the church, every person who makes up the church are called to be hospitable. Not conditionally, unconditionally. Not because people deserve it, but because Christ calls for it. Listen, we need to treat everybody with this unselfish love. 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us unselfishly love and seek the best for one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves others is born of God and knows God through personal experience. Do other people see the unselfish love flowing through you? But fourthly, when it comes to extreme servanthood, we need extreme humility. We need extreme humility. I want you to hear this. You cannot be full of yourself and Christ at the same time. You might think you can, but you can't. You cannot be full of yourself and Christ at the same time. Only one or the other can consume all the space. Listen, the world's view is I don't want to do anything if I feel it's below me. Now, some of y'all know the ages of my kids. They're 24, 22, 20, and, 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 and 14. And, 
And um, how many of you know with your kids, you have some hillbilly deluxe conversations? That's just how it is, okay? Um, and on one occasion, we were talking about work. And thank God my wife backed me up on this. And we were just trying to make it clear to our kids that um, we've always just done whatever it takes, okay? Um, uh, I, I've never been, still am not. I am not above working at McDonald's. I think when we say it that way, I think we say it dead wrong. You might not want to work at McDonald's, but you need to not go, well, McDonald's people are here. Don't be mad with them just because they can't get ice cream right. That's not their fault, by the way. They, I'm, I'm convinced. The company makes it a defect so that you buy more burgers. They're not making their money off the ice cream. But I want you to hear me right now that, that you can't ever think and operate as you're above things. Listen, when I, first, when I, when I started my first church, my in-laws will tell you, uh, while I have a bachelor's and a master's degree, I was working to start that church. I, I worked Ryan's restaurant. Some of you don't know what Ryan's was. It's, it's, a, it's a place from God that was a buffet, good buffet and yeast rolls. And listen, I waited tables at Ryan's restaurant. I wasn't sitting there. I, I had waitresses, though, who didn't like me because I got better tips than they did. Okay? And here's why. I just went ahead and started pastoring everybody I went to. I'm like, I know you're just here for this huge shoulder and all, but another thing. And um, no joke. I mean, I, I, I just experienced that. But, um, but, and I worked at, um, green, at, at landscaping by day. I, do I look like a landscaper to you? Okay, but I've, I've, I've been there, and, and, and I just say that for this. You, you really find yourself with the wrong mentality when you say those people. People are people. People are people. The world's view is, I won't do anything that I feel is below me, but Jesus never looked down on anybody. In fact, he made it a point to hang out with people that the other religious people said, hey, we don't like them. They're not a part of the club. They're not welcome. Jesus did confront those who were puffed up with religious pride and thought they were better than everyone else. Listen, Rick Warren once said, he said, you can't be a servant if you're full of yourself. It's only when we forget ourselves that we do the things that deserve to be Remember, listen, Christian servants don't promote or call attention to themselves. They seek to be humble. And maybe you've been like me. You, you know, you've had seasons of your life that you thought you were humble, and then God humbled you. That's what my experience has been. I thought I was, I thought I was really humbled, and then God just needed to break me a little more. Galatians 5.13 says, You, my brothers and sisters, serve one another humbly in love. Listen, Jesus was our extreme example and talked about humility. Look at Matthew 20, 25 through 28. It says, but Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in the world, they lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Listen, we are called to give our life, and all God asks of us is that we walk humbly with him after we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. Philippians 2, 3 through 7, it says, Do not do anything out of vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. That's the key right there. Do you value others just as much as you value yourself? In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself Nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. One of the things I had to do when, 
when I when I, God was first ever leading me to to just try to lead out a totally unselfish mission, um, I had to I had to completely humble myself. It was it was as if I was just cutting all my degrees up because I had tons of jobs still would that I could go take and that would pay me more that would that would already be existing and this and that and 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 I, I just decided in my heart that it was too important to get the mission right to try to join a club or to just try to maintain something. I don't want to just try to maintain something. I want to raise up an army of people who will reach people. That's what we're trying to do. But before we can do that, listen, we have to be humble, we have to be unselfish, and we have to say Jesus is the model, Jesus is the example, and Jesus is who I'm following. But last but not least, when it comes to extreme servanthood, number five, we need extreme commitment. We need extreme commitment. I want you to hear this. Without extreme commitment, your desires will be easily derailed. Man, I, I, I just think about that. I'm just even talking about now. <laughs> if, if I didn't know where I was supposed to be and do what I'm supposed to do, and didn't commit that, hey, God, I will stay where you want me to stay. I will go where you want me to go. I will do what you want me to do. No matter what, I'd have been off track. I'd have been given up. You would, too, in certain things. If you just had a give up mentality. There's a difference in giving it up to him versus giving up. Don't give up. Listen, if you know you're on the right track, doing what God called you to do, trying to take the next right step, stay on that path. Stay on that path because it's going to take you somewhere. And where it's going to take you is better than where you would take yourself. Have you committed in your own heart unconditionally that, God, from this point forward, I'm going to commit my life to you. I'm totally, radically committed to you. And no matter what anybody else does, no matter what anybody else says, and no matter where anybody else goes, I'm doing what you want me to do. Until you have, you have not. There's a reason why that song, I've decided to, turn, to follow Jesus, no turning back, was such a big hit. Though none go with me, I still will follow. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. Listen, Jesus makes it very clear that we have to make a choice. You cannot serve two things. You cannot serve two masters. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve money, possessions, fame, status, or whatever is valued more than the Lord. Do you think that I'm not human just like you? And don't think about things that I would like to have, things that I would like to do, and other ways that I might could get ahead in life. But I want you to understand, there's only one road I want to take, and that's the narrow road that he has for me. I, I, I've already decided when, I, I, I mean, again, I decided 30 and a half years ago, hey, God, everything, everything from this point forward. It's the only reason you're looking at me. It's the only reason some of you are looking at me. You really meant your commitment. You're trying to the best of your ability, and, and, and you've got to resolve. Sometimes you have to regroup on that and say, you know what? But now I'm even more, I'm more on this, God. I'm, I resolve in my heart that I will stay where you want me to stay, and I will go where you want me to go. Listen, everything we ever do, it is meant to serve God and others wholeheartedly. Not something we do out of obligation, but expectation. I want you to hear that. God's not just wanting stuff from you. He's wanting stuff for you. Ephesians 6, 7 says, Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. To stay totally committed to following Christ, you can't get caught up in what others do or don't do or how you feel or others feel. You need to know that God will reward those who are faithful to him, those who live committed to him. Lately, one big thing I've been experiencing in my life is just, um, just God's blessing, just God's blessing of, of just being an imperfect person, just staying on God's track. And, and um, sometimes you, you, you just, when, when God finally gets you where he always told you he was going to take things, it restores your faith. It strengthens your faith. 
It, it elevates your faith. And so you're like, man, God, I think I'll follow you on here on out because you really do have a master plan. You really do have the right way. You really do reward those. You really do work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose for them. Are you walking in his purpose? Are you keeping your little hand in his big hand? Are you seeking to be his child and, 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 and serve him no matter what? Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Did you know every opportunity you have and every gift God's given you, He wants you to let Him use that for His service. 1 Peter 4.10 says each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Philippians 2, 8 through 11, it, it talks about how Jesus finished faithful. Listen, it says, And being found in, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and he gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen, had Jesus not been committed, we would have no reason to worship today. Had Jesus not stayed the course, we would not be able to be eternally changed. And now God calls us to, to carry our torch, to be the Jesus that needs to be out there, where we live, where we work, where we play. The ultimate goal needs to be there. We hear these words of Jesus, Matthew 25, 21. It says, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful and trustworthy over a little. I will put you in charge of many things. Share in the joy of of your master. God just quickened something in my spirit to say this to you. A lot of people are always wanting something else than what they got. And God's going, listen, once you've been faithful with that little, I'll give you a lot. Once you, once you complete this task, we'll get to the next. He's taught me, I got to be patient. Wait patiently on the Lord. Maybe that's where you are today. You're like, man, I've, I've lost all my patience. Keep patient. Keep pursuing him with all of your heart. Would you bow your heads with me today? Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray today, Lord, that each person might have heard your word with your love, with your will. God, I pray that each of us would resolve in our heart that we will follow you all the days of our lives. Lord, that we would truly live like children of God in such a way that brings all glory and honor to you, in such a way that points men, women, boys, and girls to Jesus Christ. God, swell up within us, God, your love. Lord, your, your um, humility, your unselfishness. Lord, may we seek to follow your son Jesus' example. God, give us the grace we need. Give us the direction we need. Give us the strength that we need. God, I pray today, if there's someone, Lord, right now that's never invited Jesus Christ to be their Savior, and Lord, I pray today would be today that they admit their sin. They believe in you, Jesus, God's Son, that you died on the cross for their sins and that you overcame the grave the third day, Lord, giving options, Lord, to not only overcome their sin but overcome eternity in hell. Lord God, I pray that they confess Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord today. Lord, I pray for others who may just need to, to rededicate or, or resolve that, hey, Lord, from this point forward, no turning back, I'll follow you. Lord, we give this altar time to you, and I pray that each person, Lord, might respond in a way that brings you the most glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you would, please stand with us. This altar is open. I'm available here should you want to come and...